my privilege to introduce our speaker and our graduate. Uh, His Excellency Rodrigo Darato is the ninth managing director of the IMF. He's held this position since June of 2004. The IMF, of course, includes 184 countries whose goal is to foster global monetary cooperation, achieve financial stability for world uh, economies, and facilitate international trade and create sustainable economic growth while reducing poverty. Uh, His Excellency Rodrigo Dorato is a graduate of our MBA program, class of 1974. You might have, some of you might have been at the event earlier this week on Wednesday when Paul Odolini, the CEO of Intel, came back for the Dean's Lecture Series. He graduated with his MBA in 1974 as well. So we have high hopes that every 31 years at least we will have <laughs> two distinguished graduates and high hopes for the, for the graduating class this year. Following his graduate studies at Berkeley, uh, Senor Sen- Rato returned to Spain where he served as a member of parliament from Cadiz and later from Madrid. I'd note this as important so that those of you who think that a career in politics uh, is a dead end might observe that there are possibilities that follow. <laughs> Should that be relevant to anyone? He was a member of Spain's he was a member of Spain's Parliament from 1982 to 2004. Uh, uh, Senor Darota was appointed Vice President for Economic Affairs, Ministry of Economy in 1996 with the victory of the Popular Party. And it is in, in his time as the Minister of Economy, Business Week described the, uh, the, the minister as architect of Spain's economic miracle, credited him with an economic turnaround, reducing inflation, bringing the government deficit under control, creating new jobs, cutting income taxes, boosting economic growth, and of course, bringing Spain fully into membership of the European Economic Union. Mr. Dorato also earned a law degree in 1971, and then a PhD in economics from 2003 from Universidad Complutense. Uh, At the IMF, uh, Director De Rotto has been singular in bringing a focused approach on IMF's work for low-income countries. This last December, he presided over IMF's approval of 100% debt relief on the $3.3 billion owed to the IMF by 19 of the world's poorest countries. Finally, I want to say how proud I am on behalf of Haas to welcome back one of our own who symbolizes the global focus in research, in study, and in implementation of policy uh, for which our school is so distinguished. But surely, today, we recognize the distinction that Mr. Garato brings to our school, having flown across the country to be with us today. Won't you join me in welcoming back to Berkeley our alum, Rodrigo de Rato. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all. It's for me not only a pleasure, but more than that, to be back at uh, Cal. And um, I would like to talk today about, mainly about the global economy. Um, I know this is a place in which uh, a lot of uh, global issues are looked up. But I would like to give you a a view from uh, the International Monetary Fund in which not only I would like to talk about the global economy, but more specifically about the global risk, what we could call global imbalances. Imbalances are not a new phenomenon in economics, as many of you know. But globalization, among other things, has changed also the nature and the size of those imbalances. And of course, it has provided with uh, maybe new opportunities to deal with them, but at the same time, uh, new risks. Globalization has changed many things in macroeconomics. And some of them, we can even measure them. I think there is a really a, a big consensus to accept that the actual US current account would be impossible to handle if it was not for global uh, international capital markets. So in that respect, we can see that globalization, among other, uh, in other examples, is making global imbalances, in this case, bigger, but at the same time is allowing countries, in this case the United States, to benefit from 
global markets that are able to finance more than 6% of the, of the GDP of the United States in a current account imbalance. I would also li would like to look at those global imbalances, uh, not only from a point of view of uh, the American economy, but also from the point of view of Asia. Uh, the Bay Area, certainly Berkeley, as I remember it and I have seen today, it continues to be the same. It's very much looking to the East and to Asia. And I, I think is that that's, that was an advantage more than 30 years ago when I was here, and I believe it's an, even a, v, a bigger advantage today. But global imbalances and global relationships are um, a key question when one wants to understand not only the present role, but the future role of Asia in the world economy. But before I do that, let me uh, turn a little bit to the IMF, because uh, I'm going to take the advantage of being here to respond to some important proposals that yesterday the U.S. Treasury, uh, Mr. Tim Adams, U.S. Treasury Undersecretary, made regarding us, the IMF, and the role of the IMF uh, in the very important issue of exchange rates. I want to say that I thank the proposal for Mr. Adams. I think they're extremely constructive and extremely important. I think it's a very relevant issue that the f most, uh, the biggest shareholder, not necessarily the most important, but the biggest shareholder of the IMF, at this moment uh, sees a very important role of the institution in um, new issues regarding the relationship between exchange rates in the world. Certainly, for those of you who know it and for those who don't, the IMF was created to look into uh, the uh, macroeconomic policies and financial policies of countries, but essentially on exchange rates, and we do that. But we are very aware that we have to do that uh, in a different way looking forward, precisely for globalized issues and for the fact that today more than, uh, more than before, uh, the behavior of countries have a very important and immediate impact on uh, other countries and on international uh, stability in the world. And exchange rate is a very important uh, issue when one is regarding on the relationship between countries because at the end of the day, it marks the price in which a country can buy or sell its goods in a competitive or more competitive advantage. So in that respect, I think Mr. Adams' proposals, as I said, are uh, very well focused. They show a commitment of the United States in the role of the International Monetary Fund that I want to thank. And I also think that uh, they're um, coincidental with what the institution has been doing since uh, 2002 in regarding exchange rates. And it's certainly coincidental with what I am personally have proposed as the uh, a strategic view of the fund looking forward. I hope that uh, we will be able to work with not only the U.S. Treasury, but all the rest uh, of the uh, constituency of the, of the fund, which represents 184 countries, to really uh, make a more transparent, more focused debate about uh, interrelation between uh, macroeconomic policies of countries and certainly in uh, questions regarding exchange rates. Let me now return to the global economy. We are living in a positive, and may, many could say even very positive environment of global economy. 2004 was the best year of the global economy in three decades. So more or less, since I left Berkeley, 2000, 2004 was the best year in the world economy with a very broad uh, growth around the, the globe, and uh, 2005 has continued that tendency. And what we know about 2006, we were only at the beginning of 2006, but we already know a few things about how things are, are expected to move in the, ne in the next 10 months. We can uh, see that 2006 will be also a good year for the world economy. And that is very good news, because that, that is not only that developed economies are going to have uh, more jobs and more growth, but it's also going to give a very important opportunity to, to emerging economies and to low-income countries. And I think that is, a, a very well, um, is, is very good news for a lot of things. One of them, uh, poverty reduction in the world. The world economy has proven in recent years that it's more resilient than it used to be. In fact, 
the absorption of a very important increase in oil prices has been possible because uh, monetary policy, macroeconomic policy, and markets uh, perform better today than they did 15, 20, or 30 years ago. And you see around the world a lot of countries with more credible monetary institutions and more credible central banks and anti-inflationary policies. So in that respect, it's clearly that the world, in macroeconomic terms, has been able to improve. And it's a proof of that, certainly, is how the world has been able to absorb high oil prices. But nevertheless, um, high oil prices are going to be not so much looking backward, but looking forward, a very important challenge. Because the world will not, will not have only to absorb 100% uh, increase in oil prices in, around, in less than two years, but the world is going to have to live with high oil prices for a long time. So probably the consequences of high oil prices in, in inflation and in growth uh, have not ended in this, uh, in this moment. But we will see more challenges for countries regarding the consequences of high oil prices uh, looking forward. There is uh, clear, clearly in 2006 very strong engines of growth in the world economy that were already there in the last few years. That is the United States and emerging Asia that is growing at a rate of around 7%. And of course, there you can single out China with growth uh, of almost 10% last year. What is uh, significant is that in a moment in which uh, many countries are growing at potential, certainly in Asia, in the United States, and that at the same time we are living with a very important increase in energy prices. We haven't seen a picked up in inflation. And that is a very substantial question that we have to answer ourselves if we want to understand what is coming in the future. And globalization is playing an important role here too. The, comp the globalization of manufacturer products and the competition on prices of manufacturer products, products have certainly affect the capacity of countries to increase the prices of their products in the in a globalized market. And that certainly has reduced the inflationary pressures. Looking forward, it's going to be a big challenge to see if those uh, contained pressures because of competition are going to be sufficient with high oil prices staying for a longer period of time than we were expected. And in that respect, uh, central banks and monetary regulators are going to have a big challenge in understanding the dynamics of what is called the second route effects regarding oil prices. The question, of course, today, and uh, I had the chance at the beginning of this year of being in two important international gatherings, one in, in Basel and the other in Davos, regarding the world economy, the question, of course, today is how long will this last? Uh, we are living in a world with high growth, but uh, is this going to continue? Or are we going to be facing uh, a downturn? Are we at the beginning of the, that downturn? Is the actual business cycle too mature and things are going to change? All those are the things that I think all of us are asking ourselves. And to know that, we have to look at what are the risks. The risk that the global economy is facing maybe are not today a threat, but some of them are substantial risks. And that is what we call global imbalances. One of the, there is two important short-term risks in the global economy right now. And one uh, short-term uh, 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 possibility of risk. The two, the two short-term risks are certainly oil prices and the evolution of interest rates. The world has been living in a very expansionary global monetary policy for the last uh, four years. That uh, expansion of monetary policy has started to be corrected about the middle of 2004 in the United States. We are seeing that other central banks in Europe and elsewhere are moving also to reduce monetary stimulus 
And although up to now we haven't seen that um, having an impact on medium and long-term interest rates, so that the yield of the curve is still very flat, um, the, the question is how that withdrawing of monetary stimulus will translate itself in the financial markets and will affect uh, future interest rates and long-term and medium-term interest rates, which will have very clear effects on many issues, for instance, uh, the housing market. But, and it is also, of course, the, the, some, uh, a third possible uh, risk, which is uh, avian uh, flu pandemic, which has not occurred, and we all hope it will not, but if it does, it could have very serious and devastating effects in the world. Of course, the International Monetary Fund is not an expert in uh, health issues, but we are in financial issues and uh, macroeconomic questions. And that's why we're preparing a plan for our member countries to face what could be a liquidity problem in the world uh, if trade and economic relations will be uh, seriously damaged by an avian flu pandemic situation. Let me now um, turn to the different uh, situations of savings and investment in the world. And this is a key question for medium-term risks. This is what really is all about, about global imbalances. We live in a world that is, we have broad base growth, but if you look at the numbers, you will see that a substantial part of that growth is differently uh, produced in one country than others. You have heavy current account surpluses in Asia and oil producing countries, and you have the correspondent uh, current account deficit mainly in the United States, but also in some other advanced um, economies like the UK. And you have a situation of more or less external equilibrium in the case of uh, the European Union. That uh, differences of growth patterns and how those differences affect financial equilibrium is a key question, not only for the present situation of the world, but also for the future. At the end, the question is how long can the world savers be willing to finance the US consum consumers? And uh, it is sustainable for the United States to have a macroeconomic policy based on a negative rate of savings. Maybe some of you will remember or have read a very often quoted uh, phrase by a very important U.S. economist, which is that what, is, what it kind of sustain will not be sustainable. Well, that was uh, a belief uh, that all of us share until recent years, but now you will you will listen in a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, economic debate that if something is being sustained up to now, it probably will sustain forever. Well, mm, our impression is that um, things sooner or later, if they're unsustainable, they will not sustain. And that's the situation of the U.S. Um, savings pattern. The United States has been a, a clear positive engine for the world economy. Had not been for the United States and China, the world would have had a much rougher years in the beginning of this century. So the, U, the US can claim, and it's true, that uh, a, a very important part of what we've seen as very important economic years for the world has been based on US uh, dynamics. At the same time, certainly, the attractiveness of the U.S. market for international investors is considerable. And to the fact that, as I said before, uh, more than 6% of U.S. GDP is being financed by outside savers. You can see the correspondence of current account surpluses in Russia, Saudi Arabia, Japan, emerging Asia, and mostly in China. 
The question, of course, is if this, at these volumes of uh, financial transfer, can we establish a sustainable pattern of growth in the United States? And at the same time, if this pattern of growth in the United States is compatible with the medium and long-term challenges of the United States. And our sincere answer is that they're not compatible. The United States, like many societies, is facing a very important challenges in aging population and in health cost. And those challenges will, have, will, will require substantial bigger amounts of uh, funds to be devoted and without an increase in domestic savings, both at the private and public level, the United States will not be able to meet those challenges. And we are not maybe talking about challenges of next year, but we're certainly talking about challenges of the next decade. And a decade can come faster than one thinks. So in that respect, the need for the United States to reestablish a certain level of internal savings that will have automatic consequences on its current account is a need that also can be explained in terms of global imbalances, but certainly can be explained in terms of domestic needs and domestic balances. The good news is that there is time to make the United States transition from the point of view of internal savings. Nothing demands immediate action in that terms. But at the same time, the fact that we have time doesn't say that the movement cannot, has to wait till the last uh, minute. We need a change in the savings in the United States, both private and public. We need really the United States to be able to fulfill its own uh, targets of uh, reducing substantially the public deficit in the next four years. And to do that, the United States will have to have uh, a more ambitious uh, fiscal policy, both in the terms of expenditures and in that respect, the debate about social security, but even more importantly, the debate about health care is a very important debate that cannot wait. But also the United States will have to look at its revenue. And uh, I think the debate about the future tax structure in the country, the need to uh, address possible new consumption taxes, energy taxes, and to really analyze the uh, consequences of the recently report to the President uh, of the Advers Advisory Council on tax uh, reform we think should be at the top of the agenda of macroeconomic policies in the United States. But global imbalances cannot be explained on a single country's responsibility and attitude. Global imbalances are the the reflection of global patterns of, of, of growth that in some cases in the United States lack savings but in other cases like emerging Asia except for China like investment or like in other places like the European Union lack growth potential. And if we want to have a continuous strong growth in the world, not only the pattern of macroeconomic policy in the United States has to change, but also other patterns of growth have to change. Because if only one of the players will change its macroeconomic policies, the consequences will probably be less growth in the rest of the world. If part of the dynamism of the US economy is not taken up by others, a reduction in medium term in the capacity of growth of the United States because an, a, a, an increase in savings could produce that unless there is external demand that will allow the United States to uh, redirect its production capacities, what we will see if others don't change their patterns of growth will be a reduction of world growth and that is not exactly what we should aim at. Emerging Asia has come out strongly from the crisis of the late 90s. Uh, in a very short period of time, reserves have been recovered, financial sectors have strengthened, and economies are growing out of hell, a very healthy 7% uh, rhythm. But investment in Asia is today 
7% below, 7% 7, 7 of GDP below what it was at the end of the 90s. And it would be very difficult for emerging Asia to keep up with the strong growth if that strong growth is not broad-based and if new sources of growth, and that is new investment, are produced. To do that, markets have to be open, uh, governance has to be strengthened, business environment has to be better in emerging Asia. The picture in China is slightly different. You, what you have in China is too much savings and too much investment. What you need in China is more consumption. And to arrive to a Chinese society that be, we, be, will be willing to consume more, you have to have important changes in the Chinese economic structure. You need to have a change in the banking system that will be able to be uh, uh, well-footed and at the same time capable of, finance, uh, of financing cons consumers. You need to have changes in the tax system that will allow low-income Chinese to have more money in their pockets. And you will certainly need a new safety net, both in terms of health and pensions in China, that will make Chinese people not be so extremely vigilant of the future. Because in China, you have levels of, of savings in the rounds of 45% of GDP. And that, of course, it's a, a level not only ecstasy for any country, but that is reducing the capacity of the Chinese economy to have a broader base of growth that will guarantee longer periods of growth in China. And certainly, through private consumption in China, will be a very clear way to share the wealth of the country in a more broad socially base. Of course, the question when one is asking about changes in policies is always, what happens if nothing changes? Well, an obvious answer, immediate answer is everything will stay as it is. But of course, there the question is, how long can it be as it is? And what will be the changes if policies don't change? Well, I think that what is evident is that if policies don't change, the markets will change prices. And if the prices are changed in an abrupt manner, the consequences could, could be extremely uh, dear for the world stability. Changes in the value of currencies, changes in monetary policy will have to respond to an abrupt loss of confidence of the markets in the actual balances, and that will certainly trigger slower growth and uh, some pain in many of the countries we're talking about and in the rest of the world as a consequence. So, the big challenge for the, what you could call systemic economies is to face important changes in policy that will not only affect global imbalances, but also will respond to the domestic agendas in some countries regarding aging populations, in other countries regarding consumption, in other countries regarding new investment. Um, we believe from the point of view of AMF that the agenda is clear. But we, we didn't see is too many movements in countries. Let me, let me uh, have some mentions about two of the other systemic areas that I have not mentioned. One is Japan and the other is Europe. Japan has been clearly one of the good news of 2005. Uh, after more than a decade of uh, crisis, and a slump in Japanese economy with the very strong deflationary pressures. We've seen the last few months uh, already some dynamism in domestic prices, and I think that the idea that Japan could be out of deflation by the end of 2006 is more than a possibility. At the same time, we've seen the Japanese economy returning to positive numbers of growth, quite important in 2005, and still around potential in 2006. So we're going, if everything goes as we see today, and there is no clear signs that nothing could derail that possibility, I think we're going to see the Japanese economy coming out of deflation by the end of this year. 
facing new challenges both in terms of uh, fiscal and also monetary policy, but certainly having a very positive contribution to the Asian and to the world economy. Why Japan has been able to, to get out of the recession and deflationary situation it was in is clearly a combination of uh, good monetary policy, expansionary monetary policy, and uh, structural reforms that have made the Japanese economy much more flexible, more open to the world, more capable of gaining new dynamism. And in that respect, I think that the agenda has been an important success. The European Union uh, is probably of the industrial countries the one with least growth potential. Most studies will tell you that the growth potential in Europe is below 2%. That is uh, very low growth if you measure it with the United States or if you measure it even with Japan. And is, in fact, insuff insufficient growth if you look at the needs of the European countries regarding social uh, costs that uh, derive from aging population problems. In fact, what is called the European social model will certainly be in great danger unless growth potential is enhanced in Europe. And at the same time, as everybody can understand, uh, a stronger growth in Europe will be very beneficial for a growth-based growth in the world. The question, as I said, is that global imbalances in the world are resolved in a constant manner and we avoid uh, abrupt change in uh, macroeconomic circumstances. Because an abrupt change in macroeconomic circumstances will not only have consequences in the real sector, but will certainly have important consequences in the financial sector. And that, of course, could trigger, as I said before, important changes in the relationship between currencies and the need for strong and immediate action by monetary authorities that could trigger interest rates uh, much faster than we are seeing today. And that brings me back to the uh, short-term risk of monetary policy in the world. As I said before, the key question of the world economy is the evolution from a very uh, expansionary monetary policy worldwide to a more uh, 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 neutral monetary policy. And that could be very badly affected if global imbalances trigger a quick reaction, reaction by central banks. Let me, let me finish and get into the, into the questions uh, by you, which probably um, will, be, will be more important. But just let me mention uh, a couple of, uh, of issues regarding the role of the institution I have the honor of, of leading in this, um, in this moment. The International Monetary Fund was created 61 years ago at the end of Second World War to try to avoid the mistakes that triggered the Second World War. And that is to try to avoid macroeconomic policies that from different countries that will affect uh, international macroeconomic stability and financial stability. Um, the, world of the, the world of 1944 was a very different world from today. Most of the countries that belong to the International Monetary Fund today, 184, didn't even exist at that moment. And if they did exist, were in a different political environment. Well, through, through, through all these 61 years, we've seen the movement of uh, decolonization in, in Africa and Asia. We've seen the changes in the Eastern European countries the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the emerging of new economic forces in many areas of the world, but probably more significantly in Asia. In that respect, the fund has adapted to that circumstances, but continues to be the most important fora for international cooperation and international surveillance. 
As I mentioned at the beginning of my words, uh, yesterday the U.S. Treasury Undersecretary, Mr. Adams, Mr. Dean Adams, make very important contribution of our debate regarding exchange rate policies. The, F the International Monetary Fund is playing an important role in trying to promote uh, the uh, balance uh, solution of global imbalances. It's trying, to, trying to, to craft different domestic policies that will sum up to a global response to our challenges of today and to the challenges of medium term that in many countries are related to aging populations. We have a unique capacity to analyze countries. In fact, we survey countries every year, and we, of course, have a very close relationship with governments that allow us to advise them, sometimes publicly, sometimes in a more private way, but that give us a, a broad view of what is the challenges that every government is facing and the contribution of those challenges to a more multilateral surveillance role that we also play. As an international institution, uh, we need to respond to the changes in the world. And certainly one of the important changes in the world is the need for the new economies that have gained weight in the last 15, 20 years to increase their voice and representation in our institution. And that's one of the issues that um, that we are facing in our uh, strategic uh, review that I mentioned before. I have tried to make a, a picture of how we see the world today and um, what is what is at stake. Uh, and to end my first remarks, let me tell you that um, the world has proven, at least in macroeconomic and financial issues, that things can change for the better. So this uh, sometimes pessimistic historical approach that things never change and if they do change, they change for the worst is not necessarily true and is not true in macroeconomic terms. But the past is a good basis for learning but it's not where the future is rooted. The future is looking forward. And in that respect, there is a very important agenda of uh, macroeconomic policy in the world, and I uh, have tried to uh, make you aware of the most important aspect of it. Thank you very much. We'll invite those with questions to come down to the two microphones. And while that's happening, I, well, there's, we have one. I, please, won't you commence? Come over here. Let the lady out. We'll still let the lady go first. It's, uh, she was recognized first. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. I'm Julia Walsh. I'm a professor over at the School of Public Health. I teach health care in developing countries and maternal and child health. Uh, my question is about the role of the IMF in, uh, in uh, inequalities and disparities within countries. You mentioned China and the need for uh, decreasing the uh, disparities there. Uh, it has impressed me that sometimes with structural adjustment, uh, the inequalities have worsened in many countries. Gini coefficients have gotten larger. And even more recently in the past decade or several decades, there's been a worsening of Gini coefficients, it, uh, coincident with uh, increasing and improvement in the overall macroeconomic uh, uh, growth in the, without the world, throughout the world. And I'm interested if uh, the IMF feels that, uh, that uh, putting some incentives in place in some countries to decrease these inequalities is important for, uh, uh, or is it, uh, uh, will we see the same kind of economic growth if, even if we don't uh, work in that direction? Well, macroeconomic stability is very good news for, for countries. Um, you talk about inequalities. Um, if you have a 200% inflation, you have the biggest inequality of all. So um, there is no, in my opinion, there is no, there is no doubt that low inflation, efficient fiscal policies, sustainable debt situations 
are extremely important for building up new opportunities. But they're not sufficient. That's true. You can have a very good macroeconomic situation in terms of debt sustainability and uh, inflationary situation, and you can have extreme inequality. Um, to do that, to, to work on that direction, you, have to, uh, you, you don't have to challenge your macroeconomic uh, situation. Macroeconomics is not responsible for that. Um, so uh, you will be making a big mistake if you believe that you're going to solve inequality by making your macroeconomic situation unstable. Uh, you, will, you will do the, the, the opposite. Well, you, you have to do many things in many areas. But in the areas that we work, there is things to be done. Uh, fiscal transparency and efficiency is very important. Mm -hmm. The capacity of social programs to deliver to the poor or to the ones that are targeted instead of being inefficient is a key question for inequality. The capacity of countries to devote more resources to investment, both social and physical, and to have less resources devoted to paying the debt is, is, a, is a key question. Um, and certainly tax bases. It's very difficult to have social inequality when you have an economy with less than 15, 17 percent of tax uh, in relationship to GDP. And you will be surprised, if you don't know it, how many poor countries have very low tax bases. Uh, and we are advising them to broaden their tax base. Because a broader tax base has very good beneficial consequences for a country in terms of fiscal sustainability, but also it provides the state with resources to face um, inequalities. Inequalities are related very often to unemployment, very often. If you have low employment, probably you have very few chances of have equality. And to increase your chances of employment, you have to make your private sector flourish. You have very few examples in the world of broad employment that in which you don't have good dynamics in the private sector. Strong companies, strong business, but also a lot of medium and small size enterprises. And to do that, to have that, you have to have transparent legal resources, legal rules, you have to have independent courts, you have to have well-functioning labor markets, you have to have good taxes, intelligent taxes, you have to have usually an open economy. There is a very clear relationship in our research between growth and openness. Open countries have much better growth patterns and stronger ones than closed countries. So, although we are not a development agency, and many of the specific questions that you might be looking into for inequality, I cannot answer them. I think we have a broad view of what is required in macroeconomic terms. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Director, welcome back to Berkeley. Uh, I'm Mark Osterhaus. I'm in the exe Berkeley Columbia Executive MBA program. You mentioned three causes, potentially causes for the global imbalances, the lack of savings in the U.S., the high savings and high investment in China, and the low growth in Europe. In your opinion, which of those three needs to be fixed first, and what specific recommendations are you making, or is the IMF making, to, um, or changes in policy are you going to implement, or are you thinking of implementing to fix the issues? Well, uh, every one of them is important from the point of view of the countries, and at the same time, from the point of view of those countries' role in the world economy. Uh, the, world, the world's big and round. You have a lot of countries. But the three ones, <laughs> the three ones you mention, uh, if you take the European Union as a single economic entity, are key for the rest of the world. So in that respect, whatever happens to the United States, China, or to Europe, uh, will be a substantial part of what can happen to the, to the world growth. In that respect, um, the actual model of growth in the three parts, in the three, example, in the three uh, areas, uh, has uh, built-in 
imbalances that will become more and more complicated, and if you want, dangerous down the road. The lack of saving the United States will be very difficult to sustain, and if it's sustainable, it will be at different prices, and different prices of currencies derive different prices of money, and different prices of money derives different capacities of growth. The concentration of China on external demand for growth and the high levels of investment, and around 30 or 35 percent of GDP, uh, are dif difficult to sustain, but are also probably a source of inefficiency. And as we have seen in the Asian crisis of the late 90s, and also in the uh, stock market crisis in the 2000s, investment inefficiency sooner or later hunts you back. And um, the need for China to broaden its uh, growth pattern will an allow China to make more Chinese citizens uh, benefit from growth and at the same time have a much more balanced economy and a, mo a more efficient one in which investment could pay itself uh, because there will be more efficient investments. And for Europe to increase its growth potential not only will contribute to the world sources of growth but will allow the Europeans to face a very acute aging uh, problem population. So I cannot give you a, a more urgent agenda. I think that the three areas need to face those challenges. And by facing their own interest, will be also responding to a better uh, possibilities of keeping world growth. Thank you. Um, I was just curious to learn uh, uh, the macroeconomic impact, if any, of jobs going from developed countries to developing countries, whether it's a big impact, whether it's a good impact, or whether it's a negative impact in macroeconomic terms globally. Well, uh, you, you are not necessarily, if you're talking about outsourcing, well, you are not necessarily seeing uh, that shift of jobs. Uh, because what you're, what you're seeing in most developed economies is a, an internal shift of jobs. You, you've seen, certainly, two generations ago, a movement from agricultural toward industry and services, and now in the last generation you're seeing a shift from manufacturing to services, and a broad definition of services. And that, I think, it's uh, related also to um, patterns of uh, social behavior and also to uh, value-added products that allow societies to live uh, better. Uh, so in that respect, uh, you have to ask yourself not only if uh, some products are not anymore produced in countries with 25, 30, $30,000 a year per capita income, but also because if you look at the hourly uh, cost of, of wages, uh, which certainly at, at the levels of the actual uh, our, our costs in Europe, United States, or Japan, uh, there are many products that are not going to be able to be um, produced uh, unless consumers were willing to pay very, very heavy new prices. And they're not. So. That is given economies, uh, low income and middle income economies, new opportunities. But the world pie is not, we have learned, that is not an static uh, uh, measure. The pie should expand. And in fact, free trade has expanded the pie. If we were going to be working on the same pie that we were looking at 40 years ago, well, then uh, this would be impossible to sustain. The actual levels of, uh, of, uh, of uh, social situation in the United States, Europe, and Japan couldn't have occurred, and at the same time, the 
the coming into the global economy of China's, India's, Korea's, etc., will cannot occur. So I don't think that the analysis is an, is an static analysis. It's true that you have some, some just jobs shifting from one place to another inside economies and in the global arena, but you are also seeing in, incredible uh, um, expansion of, 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 of uh, growth and, uh, and production. So, uh, and the numbers that I've seen that are most done by the European Commission don't, that do not show a big shift of, of, of labor movement between areas. It's true that you're seeing an important shift uh, in some aspects, but no, not necessarily in others. So I think that we have a world in which production has been expanded, um, and uh, in which certainly the patterns of, of, of labor are changing in more advanced economies toward a more um, learning uh, uh, type of jobs. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the trade-off between that and emerging economies is not at all uh, transparent and linear, no. Thank you. Hello. Um my name is Jana Griter Savahia. <laughs> I'm a doctoral student at uh, Cornell University. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation twice uh, the U.S. Treasury proposal with regards to exchange rates. And I'd like to relate my question to the issue of exchange rates, but uh, in the region you haven't addressed in uh, your presentation, which is uh, uh, Eastern Europe, traditional economies of Eastern Europe. And so we know that um, there is a huge heterogeneity of exchange rate regimes in Eastern Europe without any trend or any direction. And you know, the selection of the, cho the choices of exchange rate regimes in Eastern Europe uh, doesn't even correspond to, to the progress uh, of political or economic reforms of these countries. And you know, some of these countries experience, and most of them actually experience uh, throughout the 1990s, several macroeconomic imbalances, some of them financial crisis, Russia, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria. And the recommendations of the IMF were also mixed throughout the, you know, throughout the transition period. In the beginning, transition, there were recommendations of, um, you know, for, for adoption, adoption of uh, currency boards or more fixed exchange regimes. Then later on, after the Asian financial crisis, the IMF um, proved more favorable uh, towards uh, flexible exchange rates. And I was wondering, you as a representative of IMF, what is your, first of all, what is your view on the current exchange rate policies in, you know, in, in, uh, in transitional economies of Eastern Europe? I know that it's a huge heterogeneous sample, but if you can, you know, just kind of generally, or you know, maybe pick some countries which are more uh, important players. And then secondly, um, what are the recommendations of the current recommendations of the IMF with regards to the future exchange rate policy uh, in the region? The, the change that has occurred in uh, Eastern European countries in the last uh, 15 years has been phenomenal, not only in political and social terms, but also in economic terms. From very close economies, uh, totally dependent on the internal Soviet market, they have moved into open economies, uh, uh, many of them, if not all of them, very integrated in the European economy. European Union economy, and by that uh, very much globalized, because Europe is probably one of the most open economies in the world. So in that respect, the change has been phenomenal. It's true that at, for, a, for a such important change done in such a short period of time, um, the different regimes for ex 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 exchange rates have been crucial first to allow those countries to stabilize their economies, and in the second stage to allow those countries to integrate themselves more into the global economy, the European and then the global economy, and to be able also to absorb external shocks and to carry their own monetary policy to respond to their, to their uh, uh, inflationary circumstances. Um, the election of an exchange rate regime is, is a national issue. And there is many different exchange rate regimes in the world that are efficient. Uh, the, the question, of course, is that exchange rate should reflect, should contribute to the macroeconomic uh, equilibrium and should uh, give macroeconomic stability to, this, to the country. 
but at the same time should not become an impediment of competition. Uh, to do that, uh, you have not only to target uh, the determinant exchange rate regimes, but you also have to change your internal policies. At the end of the day, exchange rates reflect or should reflect fundamentals. So not by changing exchange rate you're going to change fundamentals, but by changing fundamentals you're going to change exchange rate, which is the other way around. Many of the Eastern European countries are today um, asking themselves uh, to what speed should they integrate themselves in the euro. And our advice is that that integration cannot happen unless economic fundamentals change too. The experience we've seen in history, not only in Europe, but also in many other areas of the world, is that if you define certain type of exchange rate system that is completely incompatible with your economic fundamentals, the price you pay is very, very heavy, and it doesn't sustain. Sooner or later, your exchange rate cannot hold l long enough. So we understand clearly, and I personally do too, because I, I am from a country that in which the, 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 the target of the euro was extremely important in the, in the 90s. But that demands fiscal and structural reforms that will make that relationship, that close relationship with the Europe sustainable. And until that is possible, uh, uh, more different approaches have to be done in different countries. It depends on the levels of, of, cha of, of, of uh, open economies, it depends on the levels of inflation, it depends on, I mean, it, it, it will have to go case by case. But our, our, our belief is that Eastern Europe should not be so much m driven by exchange rate um, targets, but Eastern Europe should be driven by fundamental changes that we allow, will allow Eastern, Eastern uh, currencies to, to, uh, to be more integrated in the world economy, and in many cases probably that means to be more integrated one way or another in the Euro area. Thank you.